Hi, Derek. Hi, how are you? I'm great. So I'm Mark Shapiro, music director and conductor of the Cecilia Chorus in New York. And with me is the fantastic composer, Derek Skye. The Cecilia Chorus of New York will be giving a world premiere of the orchestral version of Derek's Neither Separated Nor Undone in Carnegie Hall on Friday, April 28th. And Derek is going to talk to us a little bit about um, how we came to write this piece, how he came to write this piece, how this piece came into being. So I'm thinking, Derek, maybe a good place in for this conversation is the text. Let's start there. So you wrote the words. I did. And what are you thinking as you write the words? Tell us about what these words are about. What are you thinking? Yeah, so um, the the words in particular are like, they, they're kind of speaking to the idea of being able to, anyone that you speak to, just anyone that's, that, that you encounter, to give everyone the same amount of, um, of complexity and understanding uh, as anyone else. Uh, everybody's a really complex human being and people can actually live with contradictions. They can kind of believe one thing in one case, but believe the opposite of that in another case. And this kind of offers uh, a, a very kind of complex perspective for every, every person that we encounter. And so the, the, the text is very much um, uh, speaking to that. I know that um, people may look at the, the text and be like surprised uh, at how short the text is uh, for such a, a long epic work. And um, uh, one of it the things, yeah, yeah. yeah um, um, uh, but one of the things, one of the reasons why it's uh, that the text is so short is, um, and, and you'll hear this in the piece, is that a lot of the, the, the text kind of unfolds cyclically um, and, um, and in layers. So I'm a huge fan of polyphony um, um, uh, from, from the old styles of, of choral singing. And uh, one of the things that always fascinated, fascinated me so much with polyphony is that even though everyone was kind of reading from the same text because people would be kind of entering and exit, exiting in different spots and having all these contrapuntal lines and counterpoint, uh, there would be these other kind of words that would be like a ghost in the background that would like emerge because of the, 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 um, the, the, the merging together of, uh, of separated text uh, between different sections. And so um, for me, that kind of gives this like three-dimensional text uh, uh, concept. And I really, really love that because you can really get multiple meanings from, from just a small amount of words just by, by um, having them kind of uh, run into each, each other and, and swirl around each other. And so this was the thing that I applied to the piece. So it's a very short text at a, in a very two-dimensional read, you know, when you're reading the piece of paper. But then auditorially, the text, at least in my hope, <laughs> that the text becomes more three-dimensional, something that's really impossible to put on the page. Um, and thinking of it more like a hologram, I guess, if you will, if you could spin things and be able to see through and, and get some other words and other phrases and other contexts that can emerge from, uh, from the music which can only really happen in sound, uh, uh, which, is, which is, you know, music is a wonderful thing. <laughs> music is a wonderful thing. And um, so as you're talking about the text and the way, um, I think it's about, you, you're saying we listen to each other, we respect each other. And I think there are a lot of people trying to do a message of this kind, but I, I've said to you before, there is something about your music and your sensibility that is extraordinarily genuine. And I think everybody who has in, uh, come in contact with this music, so, uh, you know, as, as you know, there was a chamber music of a uh, chamber version of this piece that uh, Cantori, New York, which I also conducted in the fall. And um, a reaction that from the orchestral players in particular was, this is so fabulous. And I've been getting a bit of that also from the players who've been working on it uh, <clears throat> for, our, for our upcoming concert. 
but I wanted to sort of drill down into the particular fabulousness. So uh, as I was saying, um, you have an ear, I think, for the world. Um, oh. If I were to be sort of saying who I think I've come to know you as, I think that's a nice way to put it. You have an ear for the world. And that there's a line at the end of your um, piece, no monolithic wall, which is so beautiful. And it, it comes in with such a feeling of triumph um, where we just feel, you feel the walls coming down. Um, and I think where there are a lot of energies in different segments of society now to erect walls and to kind of reinforce walls, it feels like your energy is what wall? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I I think it's it's. Um, I wrote a program note about you. Actually, I don't think I've shared it to you, but um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> <laughs> that you know, my my feeling about it is that the walls for you just don't exist psycho psychologically. So um, you really you you're hearing the whole world. So. There are a lot of strands in the piece. I wonder if you could speak a little bit about that. There are, there, you draw on different musical traditions and practices, and then you synthesize them in a very personal and very authentic way. I think, could you speak to that a bit? Yeah, yeah. So um, the, the, my musical language is really uh, very like transcultural. I, I'm, a, I'm a really big fan of just transcultural, classical music, transculturalism. Um, when it comes to music uh, is something that's very, very uh, close to my heart. I will say that um, I think the only way to get to a place like that is to respect every culture and their approach to music making uh, that you can, because if you can, if you respect it, then you can learn from it, right? Like you can, you can, you can be a part of it, of it. Um, and um, so this particular piece has uh, some some influences from from many different types of approaches to music making. My uh, foundational approach to composition tends to be part of the oral tradition. I like to play music, and and um, and then it's almost like after I play everything, then I go into the engraving software and have fun putting together the puzzle of interpretation into Western classical notation. Um, mm -hmm. but, um, but that's the joy. The joy is, is being able to do uh, 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 those things. And um, the particular uh, uh, musical approaches that, um, that I've kind of come to, to absorb and synthesize in my, in my particular style of writing is Persian classical music, West African music, um, uh, Balkan music traditions, um, and uh, uh, and in Ghana there are many different regions. So also uh, northern uh, some of the some of the ethnic groups in, in northern Ghana as well. Um, and uh, in this particular piece, you get to hear like a swirl of those things, a swirl of like Eastern folk, uh, e uh, European folk music, Eastern European folk music, Persian classical music, um, West African music. And then music that's very much part of the Western classical tradition. Um, uh, you can hear a lot of that too. So it's, uh, uh, and Indian classical music, that's also a big uh, uh, influence. Um, I use a lot of um, uh, uh, rhythmic uh, structures uh, from Indian classical music. Um, and um, I, I, in my, work and in my life I have so many friends and colleagues and really family from many different parts of the world and it's such a celebration to be able to uh, to respect and enjoy and participate in all these different musical languages um, and and always be a student of humanity like that's yeah. that's that's my thing is there I will never be a professional I, I will be a professional student of humanity and I will enjoy that for the rest of my life because um, when you if you can if you can do that then you know that you're going to be ready to learn something for the rest of your life 
Yeah, and that's what why we want to be on the earth and get out of bed in the morning, yeah. right? Yeah, all right. That's right. Right. Yeah. So I, I've learned a lot from you, and I think um, we learned a lot together about notating this piece. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that it was so interesting because I, you know, I really I think we're so trained in notation, some of us, that we really you know, you can take a step back and say, notation, it's a convenience, you know, that's really the point. So you try to really notate what you can notate and then um, get at the, the essence of the music, however you can. Um, something I wanted to just um, wrap up with as we talk briefly together is the, the question of rhythm and polyrhythm. So um, I think one of the things that is very characteristic of your music is the way you overlay rhythmic strands from these different traditions. And particularly, you and I have talked about kind of the length of a particular metric idea, um, and that we tend to think in, you know, sort of four bar, eight bar, 16, or four bar, eight bar, 16 beats, that, that kind of thing. And a lot of the, the ideas that are in your... Uh, spirit and sound world are things that might be 21 beats and 17 beats. Um, and can you speak to that about how, how we experienced one polyrhythm and your thought about that and then these asymmetrical rhythms? Yeah, of course. So um, polyrhythms first, we can talk about that first. Um, polyrhythms are something that just kind of like naturally take place for everybody. Um, your breathing is a different pace than your heartbeat. Uh, the blinking of your eyes is a different pace uh, so to the moving of your limbs. And so we're kind of living polyrhythms uh, on, on a regular basis. And, and what a joy it is when these kind of polyrhythms happen in music, because it, get, it always gives you something to listen to, no matter how many times you listen to the same thing again and again, because there's polyrhythms, you, you're hearing one thing, you're hearing another thing, and then you're hearing the combination of the two. So um, there's a lot of polyrhythms in this piece, and in particular, the, the, the types of polyrhythms that I'm most influenced by is going to be coming from uh, Indian classical music and, and West African music and Ghanaian music in, gener in particular. Um, and uh, it just makes you want to move. Like polyrhythms can really get into your body and make you want to, you know, move and, and, and be physically enjoying the music and which is something that I, I love um, when that happens in classical music. It's just amazing. I mean, you think about some of the most memorable pieces in classical music and almost every single one of them at some point has a really nice groove. <laughs> you, know? you can think of like the, like the, like even, you know, the, one of the most famous works of all, Beethoven's Night has really nice grooves in that piece where people can really, you know, get to move it. And that's such a wonderful thing. And I'm always happy to uh, uh, put that kind of stuff in my work. Um, and then as far as the, the, uh, uh, the, the odd time signature rhythms, like the sevens, 13s, 21, these kinds of things, I'm always thinking about uh, how, uh, speaking, speech. And how we all, how, how when we speak to each other, we, we rarely speak in like kind of binary terms, things can be, that can be divided by two. A lot of times just speaking to each other will have like an odd number of syllables and, it'll, and then it'll just cut off. But we both understand each other, we and very clearly uh, what's going on. And so um, one of the, the, the magical things about that is when you put that into music, at first it seems like kind of like, oh man, does this, this feels really strange, does this work? But with the choir and with the voice and then hearing the text over some of these meters, you hear it and you're like, oh, well, that, that sounds just fine. Like that, that, that actually kind of works out. And so you really get a chance to like, like have music that's, that's kind of conveying this, the, the rhythm of, of, of speech, even though it's being sung. And I think that, the, I mean, it's a, I, I guess it's kind of like an elementary thing to put those two things together, but, but when they are put together, you really do get a lot of like wild phrasing and time signature uh, situations that I think can just light up the brain and warm the heart. <laughs> they, they certainly can. And I will tell you, the chorus has been loving it, um, working on it, 
And as I said, the, the, the players who played it before, many people came up to me and said, this is quite wonderful. Um, and a lot of people who have been involved in, you know, this is people who play a lot of new music and everybody is very captivated by something very fresh about it. So um, I think we're very excited to be doing it. So again, this is April 28th, Carnegie Hall, 8 p.m. Friday. Uh, you'll be there. And I will be there. You will be there. And uh, I'm just going to put in a teaser and say, you have told me that you will be making a big announcement on April 20th. That's right. Everybody yes. uh, keep your eyes out. <laughs> keep your eyes out for some big news from Derek. So I'm going to say very much thank you, Derek. I'm going to ask you to stay on briefly. I'm going to stop the recording. Um, so thank you so much. And I look forward to seeing Derek and everybody who watches this in Carnegie Hall on April 28th. And let me just say, uh, ceciliochorus.org or go to Carnegie Hall for your tickets.